Hi guys, you're welcome to Alutrinus Ideas. In this video, we're going to be talking about classification of computers. So, computers are everywhere in the modern world, playing a very important role in various aspects of our daily lives. As technology advances, computers have evolved to cater to different kinds of needs, le leading to development of a classification system based on their size, capabilities, intended use, and all those stuff, okay? So, understanding the classification of computers is very important in grasping the diverse landscape of computing devices and their applications as well. In this particular video, we are going to be class classifying computers based on three different um, um, headers. The first one, we are going to be talking about the age of technology, the type of data they process, where we'll be talking about analog and digital computers, then the purpose, we'll be talking about the general purpose and the special purpose computers, okay? So, let's get into the first one, classification by age of technology. So, this uh, first computers, the first generation computers, somewhere around the 1940s to the 1950s. So, the technology being used um, the stored program concept inspired this first set of computers and they relied on vacuum tubes as electronic components for building the logical parts of the computer. So the technological uh, basis was made, made, were majorly circu circuitry consisting of wires and thermonic valves. So these valves were in a non-solid state as electrical impulses had to flow through the vacuum between the valves. So the vacuum tubes were large, they were fragile, and generate significant heat during operation, which is a very big red flag in modern day computing. So the development of the uh, first electronic digital, digital computers happened in the first generation. And the size of the computers under the first generation of computers, they are enormously, like very, very big physical size due to the presence of the vacuum tubes. If you, there are some pictures circulating over the internet of what a computer, a storage device used to look like. I think the, what do they call it again? The memory that was used to launch the first um, landing on the moon, I, I think it was four kilobytes or so. I think it was four kilobytes. And if you see how enormous it was, so the, the computers in the first generation of computers, in the early generations of computers, they were very, very big. So limited processing power compared to modern standards and um, they were unreliable and you can experience hardware failures at any point in time. So as for the speed and the processing power, they are relatively slow. They are relatively slow and they have limited memory capacity and storage capabilities. Unlike modern day devices, like something as little as your phone, you can be having like 64 gig storage capacity, but um, the computers in the first generation of uh, computers, they have limited memory capacity. Then power consumption. Computers in this generation, they consume a lot of power, leading to heat build up, leading to heat build up, and they require regular maintenance and um, cooling systems. So because of the heat generated, you need to get um, cooling systems, say fans and um, make space for air to come in and um, for heat to flow out of the computer, okay? So we also have the applications primarily used for scientific and military cal calculations because these are the two categories of users that can actually afford the the computers at this particular point. These are the major category of users that actually um, would require it for their computations and operations. So the examples that we have, um, we have the ENIAC, ENIAC rather, the ENIAC, the Universal Automatic Computer, so this is the model, the Univac 1103 IBM 700 series. So as for the programming, they use machine language and they use low-level assembly language as well. They had limited programming capabilities compared to high uh, to modern high-level languages, and input and output was often through punch cards or paper pipe, uh, paper tape, through punch cards or paper tapes. So output was usually displayed on printouts or electronic panels or like that. So as for the reliability and maintenance, it is prone to frequent hardware failures, requiring regular maintenance, limited operational uh, reliability compared to other generations of computer. So we have the usage con context. It is used for specific specialized tasks, 
such as scientific calculations and cryptography. So it is not necessarily a general business or general purpose computer. It is not accessible for it because those computers in the early, um, in the 40s, they, they were majorly computers built for certain industries, for certain organizations. So you get the business rules and you tailor the computer to that particular business rule. So that is that will be all for the first generation of computers. So moving on to the second generation of computers, the technology used. So they, transi they transitioned from the vacuum tubes that uh, these vacuum tubes, they moved on from vacuum tubes to transistors okay to transistors as the primary electronic component so because the transistors they were smaller they were more reliable and they generate less heat one thing you should know is that if it is technology if you want to talk about technology it needs to be saving us energy it needs to be saving us resources it needs to be saving us time when necessary and most importantly you are not compromising quality in this case transistors are smaller you are, you are saving the amount of energy it will take to move it around and to manage it generally it is more reliable and generally less and generated less heat so the heat itself is one of the disadvantages of the first generation of computers so as for the size and characteristics it is smaller in size compared to the first generation it is not small 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 but at least to a very large extent it reduces the size of the first generation of computers and improved reliability and efficiency due to use of transistors in case of in place of vacuum uh, uh, tu uh, tubes so as for the speed and processing it is faster compared to the first generation of computers and um, it also introduces magnetic core memory okay for more efficient data storage for more efficient data storage, it introduces magnetic core memory. As for the power consumption, it reduces power consumption compared to the vacuum tube computers in the first generation and it generates lower heat, leading to uh, improved system stability. So as for the application, also for scientific and uh, business applications, increased reliability allowed for broader acceptance in, radio, in various industries. So as for the first generation computers, majority of the users are organizations that can afford to um, get custom made computers for them. But um, in the case of this other second generation, it is used in both the scientific and the uh, business sector. So increased reliability allow for broader acceptance and these are some examples of the second generation computers. So the continued use of low level assembly language programming. So development of assembly language for specific computer architecture. As for the input and output, unlike the first generation, this uses punch cards. Punch cards, magnetic tapes, and um, the disk drives that we have. So they have some special printers and display for um, as a means of output. So as for the reliability and maintenance, um, compared to the first generation of computers, they had more uh, improved reliability compared to the first generation. Reduced downtime and maintenance requirements. This is a very big plus. This is a very big plus. Reduced downtime and maintenance requirements. So as for the usage context, it is used for a wider range of applications, including scientific calculations, business data processing, and military applications as well. So mainframe and mini computers emerged. So catering to different computing needs at this particular generation then the pioneering computers the computers that um, inspired this second generation of computers we have the ibm 700 series and the univac 1103 so these computers marked a significant shift towards smaller more reliable and commercially viable systems setting the stage for further advancements okay like i said if it is technology it will save us time energy and resources without compromising quality and anything that you are using to achieve a particular objective initially if you can get something smaller that can do it um, faster and can also do it more reliable um, without compromising quality or result then obviously we are talking about modern technology so now moving on to the third generation of computers the technology so um, they moved from transistors to integrated circuits from transistors they moved to integrated circuits as the primary electronic components so ICs incorporate many transistors on a single chip 
So if you look at what they were doing in the second generation, so they moved from vacuum tubes to transistors. But in the case of the third generation of computers, they were having multiple transistors in a single chip. So leading to uh, further miniaturization and increased processing power. So as for the size, it marked a significant reduction in size compared to second generation's computers since you can merge many transistors on a single chip and this particular computer that you produce using that chip will be able to perform a wider range of operations okay so instead of you getting four or five computers to do different things you can have a computer that is consisting of multiple chips that will perform the same operation so increased computational abilities and improved efficiency obviously since you have multiple transistors in a single environment so the first IC contained of maybe 1020 interconnected transistors and diodes given like three or four basic computer circuits on, on a single module which was referred to as a small scale integrated circuit okay as an SSI so over time they were getting medium scale integration with 100 or more transistors per chip which will make room for more functional circuits such as the adders, the counters, storage registers and um, so much more then we have the large scale integration so we also have the very large scale integration spanning into thousands and ten thousands of um, transistors in a single environment, thereby leading to even more computing power, um, the storage capacity and all those things. So in general, the third generation of computers with the introduction of the integrated circuits where you can have multiple um, multiple transistors on a single chip obviously you get a better computer so as for the speed and processing it has a higher processing speed and improved performance due to the integrated circuits multiple transistors in the same environment so introduction of the pipeline and parallel processing uh, concept we also have power consumption it consumes low power compared to the earlier generations and it has a enhanced energy efficiency and reduced heat generation you can see that from the first generation to the second generation to now to the third generation we are talking about a reduction in the heat generation the amount of heat the computer generates because if the computer is if we are used to a computer generating high um, measure of heat then even you the operator of the computer you need to be keep yourself guarded in a way or the other so as for the applications, it has a broadened application due to business, scientific, and educational purposes. So the era saw rise of time-sharing systems, allowing multiple users to, ask, to access a single computer simultaneously. Okay, since we have multiple transistors, uh, multiple um, transistors in a single environment, it gives room for different people to be able to access the system at the same time, and it won't give. Uh, if if we have a threshold of the number of people that um, this computer can take at a particular time and the number have not been exceeded then obviously the system will perform just as uh, expected so we have the programming continued use of assembly language and they introduced languages like COBOL, Fortran, uh, Algol and um, I think there is one other one I, I didn't remember to add so we have the input and the output so at this generation of computer we have uh, a more improved input, input and output devices including keyboards monitors then we have the earlier uh, graphic displays so the magnetic tapes and disk drives became more often for data uh, storage so became more often for data storage oh i made a mistake the other time while i was explaining transistors i was talking about storage at some point but sorry about that so the transistors we aid for processing this is what is used for storage this is what is used for data storage okay so we have reliability and maintenance so enhanced reliability and reduced maintenance requirements obviously leading to reduced downtime so compared to earlier generations so you can see increased system uptime and availability so this uh, computer is more available compared to the ones in the second generation and the first generation so we have the usage context used in wide range of applications from scientific simulations to business data processing we also have the, um, the educational sector as well so the introduction of mini computers and time sharing systems contributed to increased accessibility okay so 
the computers that um, the pioneer computers of the third generation include the say the IBM system 300 uh, series and the I can't remember what DEX stands for I can't remember what DEX stands for but I should have added it so DEC um, this computer so the third generation represented a significant leap forward in terms of versatility performance and accessibility laying the groundwork for subsequent advancements okay so let's move on to the fourth generation of computers the technology used microprocessors the core technology used microprocessors so it's microprocessors um, integrated the cpu which is the central processing unit on a single chip making computers more compact and affordable okay affordability is part of what um, uh, you should be thinking of in the fourth generation of computers computers became more affordable since you can have a microprocessor that is cheaper and um, will also process uh, data will execute operations and all those so as for the size and the characteristics it marked a substantial reduction in size with computers becoming smaller more powerful and economically viable so this is this is the point where a a businessman can have a computer a, a work computer in this uh, office a work computer at home since it is something that he could acquire way cheaper and it is more um it is becoming more accessible and it can um, it is having significantly improved processing speed and all those overall performance is better okay so um so marked a substantial reduction in size with computers becoming smaller and more powerful and economically viable okay microprocessors enable the development of personal computers which is pcs okay i'm on a pc myself so speed and processing um significant improvement in processing speed and overall performance microprocessors allowed for greater computational power in a smaller form factor okay so now you have better computation power and you are going you are going to be do, executing a lot of operations with uh, with less time than you would normally so obviously one would naturally prefer the third generation the fourth generation computers to um, the previous generations so we have the power consumption it consumes low power compared to the previous generations improved energy efficiency with the use of microprocessors in the place of integrated circuits okay so as for the applications we have the personal uh, pcs it became widespread leading to a shift in computing accessibility diverse applications emerged including the word processing the spreadsheet the early gaming so um, as for the programming, continued use of and refinement of the high-level programming languages, development of software applications for various purposes. As for the input and the output, so the, we now have a better user-friendly input and output devices such as the keyboard, the mice, then um, the ma mice is basically your, um, what do they call it again, your mouse for shifting your cursors and clicking and all those so as for the reliability okay we also have a improved graphic user interface and the monitors for more interactive computing so moving on we have reliability and maintenance improved reliability and reduced maintenance needs compared to earlier generations so increased user-friendly interfaces contributed to ease of use okay so not everyone is tech savvy not everyone is tech savvy. You cannot you cannot expect me to want to build a, an application for maybe the VC of University of Lagos, something that the VC is going to be using, and you're expecting me to be giving uh, my current VC something like something here. No, 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 no. This is this is just a console application. She will not be able to use this, or even if she's tech savvy, this this is a very um, this is not a standard way to present to write a software. A modern day software for somebody like the VC of a university okay so you are you are going to be needing something that has a graphic user interface something where all she has to do is just to click from here with a few clicks she can get a lot of things done but you cannot achieve it using the terminal uh, window which most uh, computers uh, used before so we have the increased um, user-friendly interfaces which contributed to the ease of use as for the usage context, we have uh, personal computers became more compliant in homes and offices. 
Microcomputers found application in education, business, and personal productivity. So the pioneering computers in this generation include the Apple II, the IBM PC, and various microcomputers from companies like um, Commodore and um, Atari. So the fourth generation marked an era of personal computing, bringing computing power directly to individuals and transferring, transforming the way people interact with computers. Okay. So the fifth generation of computers, so characterized by advancement in very large scale integration technology and focused on parallel processing. So distributed memory architecture, talk of the SIMD architecture, which was introduced and we had some introduction of new technologies such as AI and um, SPACT uh, systems. So the size and the characteristics, continued materialization of components with the use of the VLSI technology increased emphasis on parallel processing for improved performance. So then we have the speed, further increase in processing power, in processing speed and computation power, in integration of multiple processors for parallel execution of tasks, okay? So we have the power consumption, ongoing efforts to improve energy efficiency and reduce power consumption, Integ integration of power saving features in processors, okay? Power saving features, for example, I have a computer here, if I click on this, you will see the power saving mode, power saving mode, okay, it's not here, power saving, saving, so you can see this thing I have over here, with all these options, I can easily um, save power for one reason or the other, so I think the battery saver should be somewhere here, okay, should be somewhere here, yes, this is it. This is it. So, um, where was I? If exactly. So, as for the applications, rise of AI applications, machine learning and natural language processing, growth of the internet and networked computing. We also have expansion of applications in the field, such as the healthcare, the finance, and the entertainment. Then, as for the programming, development of advanced programming languages to support AI and parallel processing as well. So, increased focus on high-level languages and scripting languages. As for the input and output, um, we had an evolution of user interfaces with more sophisticated um, graphic displays, emergence of touch screens, voice recognition, and other advanced input methods. As for the reliability and maintenance, continued improvement in reliability with advancement in hardware and software. Okay, We also have development of fault-tolerant systems. Systems that when um, something goes wrong, they don't readily throw up, they don't readily shut down, okay? They will try to troubleshoot and see if there is a way you can, they can suggest a fix or fix it by themselves. So, as for the usage context, we have div diverse applications in scientific research, business intelligence, virtual reality and so much more. So, increased integration of computers into the everyday life with the proliferation of smart devices, okay? So the pioneering technologies, introduction of the IRSC, reduced instruction set computing architectures, growth of AI technologies such as the neural networks and the deep learning, okay? So we also have the ongoing exploration of quantum computing as a potential future technology. So the fifth generation presents a period of continued innovation and diversi diversification in computing technologies. The focus on parallel processing AI and the advancement of um, applications has led to a wide range of possibilities, shaping the current technological landscape. As technology continues to advance, okay, the fifth generation sets the stage for future breakthroughs in computing. So that will be the end of classification of um, computers based on the age of technology. So now we are going to the type of data processed. So under the type of data processed, we have analog, digital and hybrid basically. So computers can be classified into different types based on the nature of data they are designed to process. Let me see if I can increase this thing. Okay. 
so they are designed to process. The classification is primarily determined by the characteristics of the data and the tasks for which the computers are optimized. Okay, two things that uh, will influence the classification under this particular category: the type of data processed and the task for which the computers are optimized. So the type of data can be discrete or continuous. Okay, discrete data, data that can be counted. Data where we have something like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, data that you can count. For example, you can count the number of people on a walkway, the number of students in a class, the number of cars on the road, the number of people in government, the number of, the number of, the number of, you get something you can count. That is discrete data, okay? Then now we have the continuous data. The continuous data, um, you cannot count them, but you can measure them. For example, your weight, your height, your 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 weight your height your body mass index um water you cannot count water you can only measure water so those are the two type of data uh, the the classification of data that we can have now the first type of classification of uh, computer based on the type of data process we have the analog computer this analog computer it measures continuous data only. Okay, analog computers process continuous signals for data that vary smoothly. They are suitable for tasks involved in physical involving physical quantities such as temperature, pressure, or voltage. If you take a good look at the weighing machine that you have, you will see a particular meter that is um, that is going to be increasing or decreasing based on the weight of the person on the place where you have to stand okay so that is an analog computer measuring physical quantity basically you are you are trying to process continuous data application commonly used in scientific and engineering applications for simulating for simulations and modeling okay so we have the digital computers these computers measure discrete data discrete data so um, digital computers process discrete data represented in the form of binary digits. Binary digits are zeros and ones. They perform calculations using discrete values and are highly versatile in, hand in handling a wide range of tasks. Okay, so the applications widely used in business, scientific research, education, and personal computing. Examples include desktops, laptops, and um, servers. Okay. We also have the hybrid computers. So these hybrid computers, the data type, combination of both continuous and discrete data. Okay. So the operation hybrid computers incorporate elements of both analog and digital computing. They are designed to leverage on systems of, on the strength of both types for for specific applications, such as, such as the real-time control systems and all that. So we have the um, these real-time control systems, I think they are very, very predominant in airports and in medicine, in for, for flights and in medicine, where time is very, very crucial, where time is very, very important. So as for the applications, the use, um, used in applications that require real-time processing of continuous data combined with computational, computational abilities of digital systems, common in scientific and industrial settings, okay? Now, we have classes of this digital computer. We have classes of digital computers. We have the supercomputers, okay? So they are exceptionally powerful and they are high performance computing machines. They are designed to handle complex and computationally intensive tasks. Utilize parallel processing to achieve extraordinary processing speeds. As for the application, we have scientific simulations, weather forecasting, nuclear research, and large-scale data analysis. When you have something like, you, should, you, must, you must have heard of big data. These are the kind of computers that they use to process big data, okay? Then they are, they are commonly found in um, research institutions, government laboratories, and organizations requiring immense computing power, computing capabilities. So we have the mainframe computers. So they are large and robust computing systems with high processing power, designed for handling large volumes of data and supporting multiple users simultaneously. Okay, they are known for reliability, scalability, and centralized data management. As for the applications, business and financial transactions, database management, airline reservation, 
and enterprise level computing when you need some anything that has that requires you to to have to 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 have a, a very very um let me say large volume data processing that is where uh, your mainframe computers come into play so we, they are used in industries where centralized processing and data management are critical okay so you have a repository for data where every other system is getting information from so for the microprocessor um, the microcomputers the characteristics they are majorly personal computers small compact and designed for individual use micro computers including desktops laptops and other personal computing devices your phone so um, affordable versatile and widely acceptable applications include general purpose computing word processing internet browsing gaming and personal productivity they are found in homes offices and educational institutions okay so talking of mini computers now the characteristics intermediate in size and processing powers between the mainframe and the micro computers so they are versatile and capable of supporting multiple users concurrently they are smaller than mainframes but more powerful than micro computers of their time so as for the applications for scientific and engineering calculations manufacturing process control and department level computing okay so used in scenarios where a balance of performance and affordability is required so this is standing between the mainframe and the microcomputers then we have the portable computers so when you hear portable anything that has to do with portable you are talking about ease of mobility so portable computers laptops tablets your phone so they are designed for uh, mobility basically they are microcomputers designed for mobility so mobility and portability compact lightweight and battery powered so unlike this uh, some of all these other computers you need a constant source of um, power of electricity for it but for these other ones your phones have batteries in it your laptops have batteries in it and all that so you know, they are compact they are lightweight and they are battery powered laptops tablets and two-in-one devices fall into this category so as for the applications we have mobile computing business presentations education and entertainment suited for professionals and students who need computing on the go computing on the go so computing on the go means um, perhaps you might be in a place like um, say university of lagos and you have some you have use for your computer in as an educational uh, as an education uh, student you have use for your computer in engineering you have use for your computer in science you have use for your computer in maybe um, social science and all something that you can easily carry around and perform all the tasks that are required of you okay so each class of digital computers serve specific purposes and cater to different computing needs. Supercomputers tackle the most complex computations. Mainframe handle large scale data processing. Microcomputers bring computing to individuals. Mini computers strike a balance for departmental use and portable computers provide flexibility for on the go computing. The diversity in these classes reflects the dynamic range of applications and user requirements in the digital computing landscape okay so um that will be all for classification based on the type of data processed so this is the last classification we are going to be talking about computers can also be classified based on their intended use dividing them to special purpose and general purpose categories so as for the special purpose computers they are engineered for specific tasks for dedicated functions specific tasks dedicated function for example your pos machine there is something that it is designed for your pos machine in um, hospitals we have machines that are dedicated to, to uh, monitoring your vitals we have machines that are the uh, computers that are dedicated to getting your uh, blood pressure per time and all those things okay we have machines that if you go to chicken republic we have machines that are dedicated to printing receipts so we have so many use so many uh, use for special purpose computers in our time and our age okay so 
um, so many businesses are building special purpose com com uh, computers for their customers. So many businesses, so many businesses. So a good example are uh, POS companies. Talk of Money Point, talk of um, pay Payday, talk of which other ones do we have? Talk of OP as well. So they are building special purpose computers for their customers. So um, like I said, they are engineered for specific tasks. Or dedicated functions they are optimized for efficiency and performance in a narrowly defined application there is a particular task a, a, a there is an application that it is meant for and it is optimized for efficiency in that particular application okay um, a good number of all the POS machines that I've seen they use Android operating system to run it now on the Android operating system you can do so many other things but for example, you, you, the POS machine it is not optimized for gaming. For example, it is not optimized for gaming. What it is designed for is a space where you can slot in your um, your credit card, your debit card rather. Then it will remove the money, give you back your credit card. That is what it was it was designed for, and it is optimized for that particular function. So it is often highly customized hardware and software configuration. Okay, so. Applications. Examples include embedded systems in cars, industrial control system, medical equipment. I spoke about medical equipment and devices designed for specific scientific research purposes. So um, embedded, uh, uh, embedded computers like the operating system in, in cars. I've seen a lot of Android um, uh, systems embedded into cars. So um, industrial control systems and all those. So special purpose computers excel in situations where a particular task requires dedicated and optimized processing capabilities. Okay. So we have the general purpose computers. The characteristics, um, it is designed to perform a wide range of tasks and applications. For example, my laptop with which I'm recording this video. So it can do so many other things. And it is giving me room for me to extend the default uh, capabilities using a software. Okay, I can. I, uh, if you come to my range of softwares now, this is Anaconda over here. I can write Python code on my laptop using the Anaconda. This is local. Apart from the um, the default functionalities of my Windows machine, I can do WordPress development on this same computer. On this same computer, um, this is Firefox. I can browse the internet. Using this same computer, this is Git for version control on this same computer. Then this is mail for sending and receiving mails. I think this this comes by default. Then you have one note for Windows 10 for jotting on this same computer. This is shortcuts with, with which I edit videos on this same computer. Okay, designed for a wider range of tasks and applications. So they are versatile in terms of software and hardware capabilities. So most general purpose computers, uh, um, you, they, have, they, are, they have a wide range of, um, of software and hardware capabilities. For example, I upgraded my Core i5 to Core i7. I might decide to get a better mouse than this. I might decide to get a... a, a, a if, if they are giving me a mouse that I can be in um, Agege and, I'm, and uh, my computer is in Ekoi, and from Agege I can operate my computer in Ekoi, I can just upgrade, <laughs> I can just upgrade to that. So j just imagine a wider range of... Um, hardware and software capabilities. So suited for various user applications and adaptable to different computing needs. You can adapt it to different computing needs. For example, if you want to play a particular game and your RAM is not um it's not capable it's not uh, strong enough for you to it's not it's not it's not up to the requirement for you to play the, the particular game. You can insert an external uh, flash then you can use the memory, the space in the flash to augment the RAM of your PC. It doesn't work for every PC, but at least I've seen where someone was using an external hard drive as uh, to augment the RAM on his laptop so that he can play uh, pairs or FIFA or something like that. So you can easily adapt special purpose computers to different computing needs. So the application includes personal computers, desktop, laptops, servers, and workstations. So they are used for tasks ranging from word processing, internet browsing and gaming to complex scientific calculations, data analysis and software 
development. Now, what is the significance of this classification? For the special purpose computers, they provide optimal performance for specific actions. They lack versatility. Okay? They are optimized for one thing and one thing only. Or, let me say, for specific applications. But they lack versatility. They are tailored design. Make them highly efficient in their designated tasks. Okay? So, if I want to bring you a bit out of the computer um, space, so if I if you come to a football pitch and you have a striker and a goalkeeper, um, the goalkeeper is trained to go keep, but the striker is is uh, trained to score goals. The goalkeeper is trained to stop the striker from scoring. Now, if you switch the two of them, there is the high, the chances that both of them will flop in the positions it is very very um, high. The chances that the keeper will flop, will flop as a striker and that the striker will flop as a goalkeeper is very, very high. So there is something they have trained them, something they are designed for. And for that thing they are designed for, they have been optimized. So we have the general purpose computers as well. They offer flexibility, adaptability, making them suitable for a broad range of applications. They are the backbone of everyday computing, catering to diverse user needs. So the choice between special purpose and general purpose computers depend on the specific requirement of the task at hand. Okay? The special purpose computers, they are ideal for scenarios demanding high efficiency in a specific domain, high efficiency in a specific um in a specific area in a spe for, for a particular purpose or for a particular task. Why general purpose computers offer the flexibility needed for everyday computing, for day-to-day -day activities, and a wide array of applications. So, the last thing we are going to be talking about is the general characteristics of a computer. So, we have the processing power. Computers are capable of executing a wide range of instructions and operations at high speed, processing data and performing calculations. As for the storage, uh, um, computers have the ability to store and retrieve data. You understand? You are storing data and you are retrieving data. This is, uh, includes both short-term memory, which is the RAM, and the long-term memory, which we, you will refer to as the ROM, hard disks, SSDs, and all those. Input devices. Computers are equipped with various input devices, keyboards, mice, uh, touch screens, and sensors to receive data and instructions from the user. Another um, input device might just be the buttons that you have on the computer itself. So, as for the output devices, output devices like monitors, printers and speakers allow computers to present processed information to users in human readable form. So, we also have the control unit. So, the control unit manages and coordinates the activity of the computer's components, ensuring proper execution of instruction and data flow. We have the ALU. So, the ALU performs operations and the logical operators and or not necessary for processing data. We have the CPU. The CPU is the brain of the computer. Contained, containing the control unit, the ALU and the registers. It interprets and executes instruction from memory. So as for the memory, computers have various types of memories, including the RAM for temporary storage and cache memory for faster access. So allowing quick retrieval of frequently used data. Memory is built up of K maybe kilo modules where K equals 1024 memory bytes. We have the binary system. Computer operates using the binary system, representing data and instructions using combinations of zeros and ones. We have software. Computers run on software, which includes the, op the operating system first. The operating system, it is what is standing between the user and the computer. Then the applications with which you are extending the default functionalities of the computer. For example, I'm on a Core i7 laptop. Um, I can install VS Code to program. I can install FIFA or PES on my laptop to play games. I can install VLC to watch movies. I can install Netflix to stream movies. So many things I can do. I can install Mozilla or I'm on Chrome at the moment to browse the internet. So you can see um, it, it, uh, the computer run on softwares, which includes the operating system, the applications with which you are extending the default functionality of the system, and the programming language that enables them to perform specific tasks. 
So we have the hardware as well, the physical component of a computer, such as the motherboard, the processor, the memory modules, the storage devices, input and output peripherals as well. Your input and output peripherals include your mouse, your printer, your monitor, your keyboard and all those things. The network capability. Now, um, before I explain network capability, anything you refer to as communication involves at least two people talking to each other. And for them to be able to talk to each other, they need to be they, 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 there has to be a there has to be a focal point for the two of them to meet. Okay? Two of them needs to be able to talk to each other first before they will understand what each other is saying. Now many computers are capable of connecting to networks allowing for communication and data exchange. It is the network that they have the ability to connect to that we allow for communication and the exchange of data with other computers and devices. Okay, So we also have the graphic user interface. GUIs provide a user-friendly interface allowing users to interact with the computer using graphical elements like icon, buttons and windows. Okay, So we have the connectivity as well. Computers come with various ports and interfaces, say USB, HDMI, VGAs and all those things to connect to external devices facilitating data transfer and communication as well. So, for example, for you to connect an external keyboard for to your laptop like, like I'm doing at the moment, um, your laptop needs to be able to connect to the keyboard. So, the operating system has drivers that will drive, as soon as I slot the USB, um, the USB to my laptop, your, my operating system, I'm on Windows, has drivers that will drive that port to note that, okay, this is an LG keyboard that is going into the laptop, okay? So when I press, um, for example, if I press anything, my keyboard is sending some signals to my computer and my computer can comprehend that this is a spacebar, this is a G, this is an H, this is a U and all those, okay? So, moving forward, we have the scalability. Computers can be upgraded or expanded by adding hardware components or upgrading software, providing scalability to accommodate changing needs. For example, you can upgrade from your Windows 7 to Windows 10. And like I did, you can upgrade your, mo your motherboard. That will be changing your computer from maybe Core i7, Core i5 to Core i7 and all those. So, as for the reliability, computers are designed to operate reliably for extended periods with built-in features to detect and handle errors. Um, if, you go, if you come to the Windows uh, troubleshooter, you will see that sometimes if your laptop should run into a fault, it is designed in such a way that if the fault is not a very complicated one, the Windows has a system on, in place that will that we try to troubleshoot the error and fix it. Or if you require maybe user admin, ad, uh, admin permissions, it will request it from you. Okay. So with built-in features to detect and handle errors, it is not only detecting the error, it can also handle it, but not in all cases. You can have a virus that is very, very sophisticated and you need to install an antivirus manually to clear the virus. So we also have digital representation. Or all data within a computer is represented in digital form using binary digits, which are zeros and ones. So we have sequential executions. So computers execute instructions sequentially, one after the other, following the program's logical flow. So you can alter this sequential execution using the programming language. For example, you might have the break, the continue, you might have the, the loop, um, you might have the loop and um, maybe the conditional statement too. I think there are four different uh, uh, methodologies. I, I can't remember what, what it is called, with which you can modify, tailor the control flow of a program, uh, tailor the uh, sequence of execution of a program to your own needs. So we also have automated processing. Computers can perform tasks automatically without constant human intervention, following predefined instructions, okay? following predefined instructions. For example, I uploaded a video on my channel, which is the React.js course. That particular um, video, I rendered it for almost more than 24 hours, more than 24 hours on my shortcut application because my system isn't equipped to carry Adobe uh, Premiere. So now, um, I just, I edited the video, then 
all I have to do is just render the video. There is an instruction for the computer to render the video. I left it, I went to go and sleep. So for 24 hours, for 24 hours plus, it was just there rendering the video. I've given it all the instructions that it needs. Just go there, render the video, okay? So another thing you can do is that you might present the instructions in form of a sequence of instructions. Line 1, line 2, line 3, line 4, line 5, line 6. The computer is smart enough to know that, okay, from the execution of the first one, when the first one is completed, go to the second one. When the second one is completed, go to the third one. When the third one is completed, go to the fourth one, okay? So till he finishes the execution. Then we have multitasking. So modern computers are capable of running multiple applications simultaneously, allowing users to switch between tasks. Okay, seamlessly. For example, I have my OBS uh, opened, with which I'm recording now. Then I have my Chrome browser opened as well. I might be running a React and a Django server simultaneously like that. So you can see multitasking ability of a computer. Then we have accuracy. If the input is correct, a computer is sure to give you accurate results if the input is correct. Okay, if the input is correct, a computer is sure to give you accurate results. So that will be all for this tutorial. We started by um, doing a bit of introduction to the classification of computers. We spoke about the classification of computers based on the age of technology, based on the type of data processed, then by the purpose of the computer, where we spoke about general purpose and specific purpose computers. Then we came down to okay to the accuracy to. We came down to um, the general characteristics of a computer. So thank you very much. Um, don't forget to like the video, um, subscribe to the channel, and um, when we drop the other tutorials too, you get notified. Thank you very much. I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye for now.